Well, thank you, Lucy, and uh, thank you, Andy, as well. I uh, really enjoyed that that um, chat, and it was very uh, honest and open. And I'm sure everyone has learnt a bunch from it. Um, we've got 40 minutes to talk about the importance of fostering uh, positive parent engagement. So I'm really looking forward to um, asking our panel of guests um, some questions and some will be general and some um, specific to both their schools in the UK and um, Singapore as well. Um, but just to kick off, perhaps um, each of you could give a sort of one minute or less introduction to who you are and what you do within your own uh, school context as well. Um, John, would you like to go first? Hello. Um, well, I work at a school called Winston Churchill School. My responsibility is for teaching and learning across the whole school, online learning, and also our what you, what you would now call character education, although we, we wouldn't call it that. So that's my, my broad uh, responsibility. We've been with FROG for, I don't, need, I don't even know it's so long, 10 years at least, I would have thought. Fantastic. And, and Lewis, thank you for joining. I know you've had a, a busy time, so thank you for making it. No worries. Um, so I'm uh, currently the deputy head at Brighton College Singapore. So we're a founding school this year. We opened in August for the first time. Um, so my responsibility is both the pastoral and academic sides of the school. Um, so prior to coming here, I was actually uh, a head of a school in Korea and we had Frog there. And um, I've then brought it over now um, to Brighton College. Great, thank you. And finally, Martin. I am uh, teaching a junior school in the north of England, in Cumbria, and I'm in the, on the leadership team and responsible for online learning across the school as well. And I'm really pleased that you have that clock in the background, Martin. <laughs> There's no excuse if I go over time. That's really helpful. Um, so first question, I think it's always useful to, to sort of start at the beginning. Um, why is parental engagement important and why is it especially important now in these current circumstances? So anyone like to kick off? I can start if you're, if you're happy. Thank you, John. Um, well, I, I mean, we've, I think schools always really value parental engagement anyway, because it's like a triangular relationship. And therefore, if you've only got a relationship with the students, um, often the parents feel like schools are a black hole that they don't know anything about. Um, I think pretty much every school since the beginning of time have been trying to work out how to solve that problem. Um, hmm. And no, none more so than in the last six to eight months. Our, I mean, the, the whole process we've just been through has been so full of learning um, and experimenting with new things that I would think um we found where we've been really successful um what we've been able to do is provide not, not just the resources for students but also the support for, for parents to make good decisions about how they're operating learning at home and then um provide what we think is really important feedback to the students that they can then work through with this, their, their children and say look you are doing well and, and keep encouraging them and I thought it was really interesting in Andy's point about, um, you know, taking starting from scratch because, um, you know, I think sometimes the conversation with assessment is very internal focused and suddenly parents are engaging with um, different forms of assessment. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking about, for example, reading, um, you know, you've got different levels, you've got different colours. And sometimes you're you're not actually sure as a parent even you know what this means. So I almost think, and I'd love to hear from from you all on this experience whether sometimes it's about taking it right back, explaining right from the beginning, and you know, can you ever make it too simple? Or any lessons on 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 that side of things as well? I think we have to go right back and make it really simple. I think we need to remember that all of a sudden parents became educators overnight at the start of lockdown. And many schools became a lifeline for, te for parents as well. And we also had to help parents um, become experts in new technologies and how to use new technologies, as well as, as students having to use new technologies as well, because we were all put in this position really fast. So it's evolved over time with our students and our parents. And we've all had to learn together a week's gone by, we've had to change things. A month's gone by, we've changed things again. And 
to, to enable us to do that, we've had to have parents on side. We've had to have parents taking that journey with us. And it's been a small step to be in the position that we're at now, ready for bubbles closing, children going home, and a new style of home learning happening if, it, if we need to. And did you find, um, Lois, I'll just ask you as well, did you find that your communications increased over that time as well? Yeah, I think for us it, it, it's quite interesting. It's a bit of a unique situation that our school only opened in August. So we got a brand new parent body, wow. all children, many of whom we had never met because they were all kind of admitted to the school uh, where we couldn't meet the children face to face. Um, and you know they'd all had very very different experiences of online learning many experiences we, we you know didn't fully understand because they've all been at different schools we haven't got a single set of children who come from the same school so they've all had very very different experiences some internationally some in singapore um so for us it, it was about kind of coming up with a very simple communication tool that we could actually start to build our relationship with our parents because we just we started from nothing totally from scratch um so we were looking at something that, that was simple, that everybody could use, but it also um, was going to be a really positive experience for them because, as has been mentioned before, some people were coming in, you know, really down in the dumps about the last kind of three, four months that they'd kind of been living through with their children. Um, so, yeah, so I, it, it was an interesting way to start a school, for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um and then, and then for all of you as well, so were there any other major changes of how you went about parental engagement sort of pre and post COVID or as we continue to live with it? Um, we, yes, we, we changed Dur during the process. We sort of evaluate, well, we were constantly evaluating the process, obviously, but we had um, like watershed moments where we changed what we were doing. So during COVID, we uh, switched all our communications through FROG because we, we, we knew that we had to simplify what we were doing, but enabling parents to engage with that was obviously going to be tricky because if you're communicating via um, uh, an app that you've already got, the emails and um, uh, then through Frog, it becomes very difficult. So we went through the, what can only be described as quite painful process of restructuring that communication to make it more effective. and. Uh, in all honesty, I'll, I'll um, say that we've been much more successful with that as time's gone on. And as we relaunched this year, um, we, and I'll, maybe I'll talk about it a bit later, but we gone directly for Frog as our only means of communication and all our efforts have been focused on making sure that parents know how to use it. I'll elaborate that later, but I'll let somebody else answer. Um, okay, and uh, well, maybe we should jump on that now, though. If you, if you're, um, um, if well, it's fine. Uh, so, I, I, my my feelings about having this conversation are, you know, what what can what could you take away from it? And for me, one of the things that we've done is we've set uh, home learning tasks for students um, that involve their parents doing things on the app and such like. Now, I'm sure lots of people have thought of that, but if you haven't thought of it works really well so you can set the whole of year seven and a task where they've got to take a photo of their parent doing something or other or they've got to have their parents sign a form that says they've um successfully accessed so and so on the school app and then the child will upload a photo of it to the homework so we've, we've really got the whole mechanism of using frog effectively with our year sevens for example um as a uh a, a way of introducing them to the home learning thing from scratch. So all AS7s come in, they've had a series of tasks like that that have been organized by a couple of people in the school who are highly motivated to make that successful. Fantastic, thank you. Any uh, any other pre or post COVID changes that you'd like to share before I move on? Yeah, I can uh, add in what kind of we've done. So we. Um, we are a primary school actually and we've only got up to year four at the moment so um, we're using for less of the I suppose homework home learning aspect we're just set up for if we need to go into lockdown again then we will have uh, a system that works and we're training the children on that but what we've been using ours for um, is all of our children have an e-portfolio so obviously with very young children it's really important that the uh, parents are able to kind of see what's going on every day and, and kind of feel like they're taking part in the lessons that are happening and really 
um, have a firm understanding because some of our little ones, you know, don't go home and say exactly what may have happened during the day. Um, so all of our children kind of have been totally kind of trained in how they kind of get onto the app, they take photos of their learning and that's kind of all uploaded onto an e-portfolio and the parents then have to make comments and they do. So you get this really beautiful interaction that's happening daily, multiple times a day, going backwards and forwards with the parents. Um, and we're also able to kind of update any rewards that are given out, any issues that we might have, reading records and things. So it's just this really beautiful kind of platform just to be able to feel like we're having those door conversations that you would usually have in a primary school um, that aren't able to, to kind of happen at the moment. Fantastic. Martin? Yeah, things sort of that we did was that every day a teacher sent out a a frog message what we what we call blue messages it's a text messaging service on frog so every child received that message each day as a check-in and teachers posted on the the class wall as well and children were encouraged daily to contribute to a class timeline and that was on top of activities and assignments that the children were set we made sure as well that activities that the children had were things that they could do as families and they weren't necessarily things where they had to have special equipment to do those activities. It was getting out into the garden, it was doing things outside and activities that they could take part and talk as a family. And we feel it brought families closer together. There was a lot more discussion, there was a lot more family time together. And we saw a lot more pictures being posted on the timeline with children having family time together. One of the... Go on. I know on, uh, I was reading one of your blog posts, uh, you know, doing my kind of online stalking thing uh, yesterday. And um, I think you talked about with the with the timeline and the use of the timeline that you saw children that were perhaps always, you know, the loudest in the class sort of engaging and being, um, you know, sort of interacting and helping others online. And I, I wondered if you'd seen any sort of parallels with the sort of parent community as well. So perhaps parents that are sometimes quieter um engaging as well whether there's any parallel that you could draw or it's, it's quite interesting actually because we've just moved all of our parent meetings online this week and we've probably had the greatest engagement that we've ever had with the majority of parents all taking part in the online meetings and that's quite an achievement really it just shows how perhaps we've taken our parents on a journey with technology and then feeling confident to take part in online meetings and them having feeling empowered to do that as well. Um, and I think that's all part of the learning journey that they've gone on with their children as well and the children helping parents to get online. The major drawback for us has been devices and families having to share devices because they've been working at home. Um, connectivity up here in Cumbria has not been great at times. You know, having down times when we've had um, everyone trying to get online for Joe Wicks and nobody been able to get online at the same time and it all been um, dipping. But we've had ongoing support for families as well. So we've used our Facebook channels as well so parents can message if they need support to help them online as well. And that has been good at the start. Support was very high and it was going on till eight, half eight at night. But as we moved through the process, that was we weren't getting very much support help at all needed so it was showing how people evolved as well in that so I, I suppose that brings me on to the the big question if i were to have one question for this session it would be how do you manage differing levels of parental engagement so you know you may have some parents that are super involved want everything online uh, want to be engaged and on you know interacting with everything and others that perhaps are you know, even very difficult to connect with in the first place. Um, and obviously the, there's um, uh, kind of concerns around that. So just wondered what your experience were of, of the sort of spectrum of parental engagement and how you, you manage that to sort of keep as many uh, parents and students happy as possible. Um, I'll start, I think that's an extremely complicated answer to that question. So I'll, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, firstly, I think uh, the the one thing that you have to start off is by understanding is that you know all parents have different perceptions of what you should be doing for their children. Mm. So the first thing we we well we've been trying to do it anyway prior to lockdown. It's not something we started. Is is communicating what what we are providing as a school and what they should expect and how they can support 
how we're trying to you know make their children amazing so from that point of view that's an ongoing thing and i think once parents understand that more that certainly greases the wheels of engagement because they understand what they're doing our curriculum is based around um, uh, skills and competencies uh, uh, with at least as much importance as the content of the subjects and parents understand those so we use things like reasoning and you know collaboration so parents can talk about those kind of things with their children without thinking they don't know what they're talking about um, so that engages a certain number of people but then what we've done with those who are harder to reach is I expect what most people have done which is during that time phoning home and that that kind of thing whereby we we, we had we had a interestingly during lockdown I think we spent everyone spent a lot more time actually working and so there was more time to spend on dedicated phone calls home and building relationships but everything we did at the time was focused on long term so we didn't do anything that was just um, throw away we everything we planned to try and have as something that would then be able to be used now as we as we're going forwards um, so reaching out to parents building relationships that would last uh, and then having the resources, the support materials, and also the in, you know, online videos, telling them how to get to whatever it is they need to get to. And finally, having it on their phone. So we restructured everything so that it's all it all works on their phone. We've rebuilt a dashboard, we've rebuilt everything so that pretty much the one thing that most people have is a phone. That's interesting. I saw a comment in the chat, which is exactly the same point that um, they almost uh, kind of negate the desktop version and just promote the, the mobile version. So to increase engagement through that way. Um, and to your point about um, sort of skills development and a broader curriculum in that sense, um, Graham's put here, Ofsted released a report today regarding children's social skills falling back. Has the panel experienced this with their students? So any comments on that before we move back to the the um, different levels of parental engagement? Yeah, I can uh, just uh, something we've uh, observed with our children. So as I say, they're all coming from very different backgrounds, but most of them were in kind of full lockdown from, you know, February. Um, you know, things very, very strict kind of out here in Asia. And uh, quite a few of our students have come from Hong Kong, actually. So prior to COVID, we were also in a lot of a sticky situation with what was going in Hong Kong before. Um, who have literally kind of not been out, not had any social engagement other than their parents and any siblings uh, for a very long period of time. And then add that into the mix of going into a classroom with all new children, all new teachers, you know, new building. We've had to do an awful lot of work with our children on kind of, we dropped a lot of our other curriculum actually and really focused on the kind of PSHE aspects and community and social skills and kind of trying to put the devices away an awful lot in the classroom and, and really going back to some of the basics. So we've definitely found that the children have, I suppose, gone, not gone backwards, but aren't as far forward as what we would expect them to be at this age because of the experience that they've had. And, and we've had to kind of alter what we do and what our curriculum is to, to take um, to take that into consideration. Well, thank you, Lewis. That's amazing to hear. Um, Martin, any, any other points there? Yeah, I think interacting in person i think that has we have seen a fall back in that that skill um definitely and children find it hard knowing how to interact with each other especially with the restrictions that we've got in primary at the moment and secondary probably as well they're finding that quite difficult how to communicate with each other and and making friendships again that's quite difficult i think one of the good things was during lockdown was we saw children interacting in a different way and showing a lot more appreciation for each other um, through the use of timelines, etc. because they were really appreciative of each other's contributions and the way they interacted with the contributions. The whole time during lockdown and the home learning on our timelines, we didn't want to see anybody using any put downs towards anybody's posts at all in the whole time. And that was lovely to see that was really nice because you would expect to see some comments of some description somewhere along the line but children i think because they knew it was a safe environment and they knew that we were monitoring it as well and we were contributing as well the the whole community which they built up in their classes was a really nice environment but back in class the interaction has 
children find that difficult in person, how to interact, how to communicate with each other. And we've, as, again, we've spent a long time doing a lot of skills on social interaction in class. Thank you. Yeah, and if anyone else wants to pop a question in the in the chat, I'll definitely pick those up. Um, so I wanted to move on to a little bit about sort of structure or your parental engagement approach. Um, I just wondered uh, across the school, um, how important is consistency of parental engagement across the school? So class to class and, uh, you know, where is that usually set? Have you found where it works, is, you know, set from the school leadership point of view? How, how have you gone about that within your own schools? I can start. <laughs> I think uh, echoing what Andy said, consistency for us is absolutely essential and everyone's singing from the same song sheet and everything coming from the same platforms, the same messages to, to parents so they all know what's expected. At the start of home learning we sent out a, a information booklet on how to get onto everything, this is what we do and sent out regular updates on how the platform works how to commune, how to get in touch with us, et cetera. So everyone knew what was happening and all teachers were involved in training. We produced training videos for staff, training videos for parents and for pupils. So if there were any updates that Frog had um, pushed out, we then made a little video to show how that worked for the children, for the parents, for the staff at all levels. And I think we produced over 20 staff training videos over lockdown as well, just each week there'll be a new update, this is how to do this, this is how to do that, and then sharing some of those with parents as well. So that, that's and, essential, I think. And from April, have you each found that uh, there's been more uh, questions from parents than usual? Like what types of questions are you getting and have you found that that kind of interest to make the school sort of a porous exchange between parents and the school has increased? Has that changed as well? Um, so we've, I hesitate to say we've been on a journey, but, um, you know, we're, <laughs> you all, we're all on a journey, aren't we? But uh, we, so lockdown came during what we've been doing anyway. So all it enabled us to do was put our foot down and accelerate about two years worth of work into about three months. Mm. So uh, what we've, so in order to answer your question, we, I don't think there were that many direct questions or requests for support. But evidently, there, every, everybody went about running a school in their house in a different way. And it was up to us um, to, as Martin was saying, to try and support that as best as possible. I mean, definitely one of my, one of my uh, hobbies during lockdown was making videos and sharing them with people and then desperately trying to get them to watch what they were doing. So we made a lot of things like um, how to use whatever device you've got. Mm. So we made a site that basically if you've got a phone or you've got a really rubbish laptop or you've got an iPad or you've got a good laptop, what are the ways you can solve these problems? And so we reached out with that. And what we actually got back was a surprising amount of gratitude from parents. Mm. And I don't mean that parents aren't grateful, but they don't usually communicate it. So um, we had more positive things from parents who honestly, um, and I'm, I'm not just exaggerating this, we're grateful that we learn as we went along. So yeah. we, we put out a letter that said, we're going to absolutely spam you with stuff for about two weeks whilst we get our heads around this, and then, then we'll sort it out. And as we went on, we got progressively better at it. And so I think that the way we worked with parents was communicating through uh, written and uh, video communication and then responding to whatever they asked for. Bear in mind that most of the communication with students was done through the assignments in FROG. So students were able to ask for specific help um, about a specific thing. And we, we banned students from communicating with email. It was all done within the assignments in FROG. So it was very focused and we could keep track on it. So one of the big problems, obviously, with, with lots of divergent communication pathways is that you can't tell if you've read everything that everybody's asked for. And there's nothing worse than a parent asking for help and you not getting to it because it went through your inbox before you had time to look at it. 
And that's an important question. So I was going to come come to that. Is this idea of how do you manage to not duplicate the work for all of your teachers, for all the leaders? By you know, you've you've got children in a um, a lockdown or a shielding situation. You've got them in the classroom. How do you make sure that you're making it easier for everyone as opposed to to duplicating it? But so for you, it was about one channel. Uh, you know, keep everything going through that. I've written something down here this morning and I, I used to staff last week and, I, and it's, I keep saying to people, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. And I think at the minute, staff are, are, are really, oh, people are feeling the pressure at the moment and with more and more isolation happening and children going off for periods of time and having to teach in class and deliver home learning as well. I think there's the, the, the people can, suddenly feel that they're having to produce teaching class and produce home learning at the same time and that's a great pressure and I think it's keeping it simple and I think that's essential at the moment don't blow it out of proportion think how can I deliver this in the simplest best way for my children and maintain quality at the same time and it's like keeping keeping it simple and pairing it back absolutely um and Lois I mean you had the um pretty challenging situation of you know, a new school uh, uh, coinciding with a global pandemic. So that's an interesting challenge that perhaps we didn't all uh, anticipate. Um, I'm expecting with your your school and in, in, in independent school as well, um, you know, as, as with uh, all schools, there's very high parental uh, expectations and um, anticipation around students' progress, etc. cetera. Um, so just wondered uh, if you could share a little bit about what parents expected and how you delivered that over this year, especially. Yeah, I mean, I think we were quite lucky that um, most of our parents were, I suppose, signed up with us, if, if you like, quite early on. Um, so we were able to do, I, I was out here for uh, nine months before the school opened. Um, you know, in a very lucky situation of not having to look after a school and just totally focused on opening. So we did an awful lot of work with our parents um, prior to us opening about what what they could expect. Um, and we obviously knew that we were having Frog come in and I'd worked with it before. So I was able to explain to them what we would be using, what would be coming in different phases. We, we didn't open up everything uh, that it's capable of doing straight away. Um, so I think we, we did an awful lot of what um, Martin and John have been saying about videos and how to use things um, without actually having to kind of do it at that moment as well. So it was more kind of pre preparation for what was to come. I think the biggest thing for us has been obviously those those expectations. You know, we were academically selective as well, um, and so our parents um, are. You know, they as all parents do, uh, they have very high expectations of their children. Uh, you know, they're, they're uh, paying a large amount of money. And so I think for us, um, we've had absolutely no issues with parents wanting to be engaged with them. It's more about they're wanting more and more and more. And so it's kind of trying to manage what those expectations are so that our teachers are able to keep up with those expectations. And, you know, now they're teaching, also doing kind of these things constantly online with parents. And it, it's more about making sure they have what they need, uh, but it's that it's it's a manageable situation for us in school as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Martin, I had a quick question for you as well. Um, so North Lake School, I've got here is a school with an inclusion quality mark. Mm -hmm. um, again, online talking um, uh, has worked to support parents of children with additional needs. So, how how have you gone about supporting that? particular community of parents and any anything you can share with the audience today on that side of things yeah our Senko, um with the strategic facility they continue to have their timeline and posted pictures but for lots of the children within our strategic facility they received their assignments as well but they also received a weekly package which was dropped off at their doors as well and um, because there's i think there were seven children in that facility last year so they received, because they need a lot of physical things to manipulate and touch and use as well. So they would receive a package of um, resources, but they would then post pictures of what they were doing as well on the timeline and communicate in that way as well. So it was slightly different for those children. However, they were fully integrated into what we were doing online as well and celebrating their achievements as well through our timelines. And they, they had their own class timeline as well. Great, thank you. And 
Um, I've got here, what are the most popular features or tools for parental engagement um, across each of the guests? So um, we've talked a lot about the feed. Were there any other areas of the, the platform that you're using that you found useful, and, and especially in terms of parental engagement as well? Um, I'll, I'll start on that. Um, I just wrote down a couple of things that I thought would be useful to say, and one of them is uh, the feedback app. So I think um, certainly when we sort of worked out what was going on in various schools around us, one of the things that we felt we were doing that was different was providing written and verbal feedback for students. I mean, we started off doing that very badly because we were everybody was, you know, all hands to the pumps. Um, but once we got the hang of it, um, where we've ended up now is that um, teachers can record verbal feedback um, and uh, students and parents can, can see that. And I think that's one of the things that stimulated the parental response was that they were able to hear what we thought about their child's work. So it made it help the child to motivate themselves to do more. Um, but also, uh, if the parent and the child can see and hear the feedback uh, in one simple place, then um, it doesn't become a chore. So parents who are at home either working from home, I mean, it was, it was pretty chaotic. I have a child myself, my daughter was there, she was seven, or yeah, seven, and um, trying to teach her at the same time as everything else. So it made us very aware of what it was like to be a parent. So we've now put that feedback front and center so that when a parent logs in, the first thing they can see is any new feedback they've had, that the child has had about work they've done. And that that kind of relationship of, of doing work and, and it being appreciated and, re and rewarded, I think was very powerful and the, we, I actually spoke to uh, Frog before we set off on this uh, odyssey uh, at the end of March, and we are really going to hit feedback hard because that's going to be that's going to make the children feel like they still have connection with their actual teacher. Because there's nothing more um, significant than hearing your teacher's voice speaking to you about your specific work. So I think that's a very powerful element of it. Yeah, that's always struck me as a bit of a no-brainer, even pre-COVID. So is that something you're going to carry on? Uh, absolutely that's that's now part of our core uh, core strategy so we we're reducing we're making it at a manageable amount depending on what the department is so um so you may set a piece of work that has deep feedback once every two three or even some for some subjects that don't see the kids an awful lot maybe once every half term but the feedback they get is really worthwhile and then and then obviously we, we go through the process of redrafting work and all that but from the point of view of engaging a parent that really was very much valued by parents. Great. Any any other features or tools you'd like to share? One thing we did is we introduced something called the Froggies, and it was an award system for engagement. So we introduced a frog of the day. So each teacher nominated a child who they felt deserved to be the frog of the day in their class. And then each week we had bronze, silver, gold, platinum, Platinum Plus awards, so children earned their badge, and we shared those on our platform and on social media as well. And that helped with engagement, and the par parents really enjoyed that, and were really keen to encourage the children to work towards one of those. And we made a specific site for that as well. So that was a really positive element of our um, journey. I think that word again of our experience on home learning as well. I suppose, Martin, that became a talking point for the kids, did it? It did. It did. And we're about to introduce it again now. It's a lot more scaled down, but we're going to introduce it over the terms as well and keep the froggies in, in the, on, the, on the platform as well. Um, oh, are you going to call us out? No, not at all. I've jumped on because Sophie is having some issues, so please continue. Yeah, that's okay. So... Um, uh, another thing that we, a, a huge change that we've made, because we use Frog Learn and we don't just have Frog Progress. So Frog Learn means that we can build websites. One of the things that um, a lot of people had to do very quickly was ha find an emergency online provider. Um, and we've been using Frog for years, so we didn't have to go to Google Classrooms or whatever. We actually, we, we, build, our, we build our curriculum online. So everything um, that we uh, want children to have access to it, it, what, it wasn't quite there then, but it but more or less is now. So a parent can go on and 
find what a student should be doing. And, and we don't do that in a lesson by lesson way. So it's not a prescriptive, it's lesson 38. It's more that the resources around the topic that you're doing are there. So if you're studying a book in English, there will be all kinds of interesting resources. Some of them very focused uh, on the book itself and some on wider reading and such like. So what we did was create, we've created a sort of um, a sky's the limit uh, resource. So if you're motivated and interested and engaged, students can can find that work. They don't have to be prescribed it by us. We can prescribe it. It's all the same stuff. So we can we can assign it to students um, if we want to. We can guide them towards it using um, the uh, progression charts and, and and that. But but also they're free to find it themselves. So really engaged students during lockdown, or students who became more engaged, were able to pursue their areas of interest more easily. Um, I so I think, love that. yeah. Um, I was going to just add one thing that the other thing we did really badly to start with was we set uh, assignments which had a lot of a lot of different things. And what we did was we've we've basically um, pared that all down. So mm -hmm. we provide information in very small uh, bite sized uh, chunks. And at the end of that, sort of you might have five slides of information and then an activity at the end. And we've kept tasks down to about uh, at most about half an hour. So that the you know it's more it's more empathetic for a child who's sitting there with a big load of stuff to do, and you're asking them to do something in the last two hours. You know, for, for us, if you're going to ask a student to do something for an hour, you have to bear in mind that their computer might not work, and all, you know all those things that might go wrong. So what we've our home learning strategy from this point forward is to provide um, targeted, uh, well designed, and very accessible tasks with uh, surrounded by. Um, jumping off points, so things you can watch or, or, or read about if you want to go further. Yeah, I'd echo that as well. We did that as well. A lot of the tasks at the start had too much in them, and people were finding they couldn't open them because of their connectivity, because of their devices. Mm -hmm. um, and we learned the hard way to begin with, and we had to pair it right back, as John was saying. So, just as I, I'm looking at the giant clock, we've got a few minutes and, and if Lucy, uh, if you if you'd like me to carry on a bit, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, well on a on a sort of larger level, uh, obviously we had all the disruption with the exams this year, and I was just wondering whether there's any, um, you know, people sort of minded to using something like Frog to chart that progress to you know if if we if we're in the situation again where uh, there's exam disruption, whether that allows some kind of continuity. Uh, around assessments as well and whether that's a factor and whether that's something that parents are interested in as well um so you know not something i'm just sort of thinking off the top of my head there whether that's uh, any benefit as well well can i come back on that in terms of frog quizzes so one of the things that you have in frog is the ability to write quizzes and what we what we learned was um that we were able to uh, and, and, um, and this is it's very important to know that we're, we're not at the end of this bit so uh, we're not this is not definitive this is where we are now so we, we we're learning to write much shorter quizzes that are focused on much higher quality responses so to reduce marking workload um instead of asking a child to write a hundred word 200 300 word answer to a question we might present them with three answers and a mark scheme and ask them to mark them or three answers and say which which one is the best answer to this question and give me five reasons so flipping the work so that it's focused differently so in terms of our exam preparation that means that we can focus students on exam technique using frog quizzes um, and I, I you know i am absolutely not saying we're, we're we've got that um sorted but it but a change in focus in the way we ask those questions means instead of having 20 questions you might have five and um, we're much more able to cope with that and feeding back to students about those things. So that is definitely a tool that we are using more um, and wrapping that up with obviously spending time, I mean, for want of a better word, teaching the kids how to learn online. Um, yes, yeah, so there's an added advantage of actually making them sort of digitally literate and that, that kind of thing as well. Um, I think it's very important. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed this year um, was that the year six is joining us in year seven because uh, they missed the end of school. They didn't really transition out of primary school properly. So they've come to us very much like primary school children. 
And you don't want to kill that off. You want to you want to keep that going because the longer you you maintain that enthusiasm and vigor, the the better. But it does mean that they run around chasing each other at lunchtime. So um, we are looking at, you know, like I said right at the beginning, we're looking at, at kind of joining the experience of the parent and the child together as they learn to 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 do this, so that we are definitely uh, in a strong position if we have to do the full lockdown again. So our resources are all in place, and our and our um, mechanism for getting the work out and understood and back should be clear. It isn't perfect. I mean, you know, if we were locked down tomorrow, we'd be really close to being there, but we wouldn't be there. You know, I suppose it's always going to be improving. Fantastic. Well, I know we're currently at time, so perhaps it's going to be uh, Lucy jumping in. Let me just see. So Sophie, thank you so much for chairing this panel. Um, thank you for those those challenging questions. It's been absolutely fantastic. I think you're kind of back and kind of going. Um, but I think the, the main things that came out of that were particularly around the use of e-portfolios, communicating with parents, involving them in their students' journey, uh, hearing their teacher's vo a voice, supporting parents as teachers in some case and also keeping it simple and being prepared and it's really interesting to hear how you've all dealt with that so thank you to Sophie thank you Martin thank you very much Lois for joining us this morning